Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. We're here today reviewing some hands from one of my Inner Circle members where he won a $1,000 buy-in tournament in Manila. So here's a very brief email he sent in to me. Basically, he won the $1,000 tournament, tournament in Manila. Congrats on that. Can you take a look at any of these hands from the early levels to see if I'm making any mistakes? Which, of course, I will. Um, if you are not a member of my inner circle, by the way, you can go to pokercoaching.com slash inner circle to check it out. Not only do you get access to all of the things at pokercoaching.com, which includes over 400 interactive quizzes, the monthly homework challenges, the webinars where I personally review your answer, and more, the inner circle also gets access to strategy sessions every two weeks where I present on the topic of their choice for about 30 minutes. And also, they have office hours where they can call in and ask me questions in real time. So far, just recently, we have this win. We also have a win of a World Series of Poker Circuit event for over $200,000. So uh, students have been putting up some pretty great numbers. You can check that out at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. And if you want something not quite as in-depth, check out pokercoaching.com. You can get a completely free trial there. All right, so he sent me in hand histories in this format. Now, I understand this is not the most beautiful format you've ever seen. However, it's a really good way to observe hand histories and get through them relatively quickly while also being able to go back and seeing going go back and see what we think could be done differently. So let's just take a look here and see where we get. All right, players have been tight and passive. You've been raising a lot and getting folds and payoffs on good hands, which is perfectly. Recently you showed down aces. There is one player in the hijack who's trying to challenge you. All right, well, let's see. In this hand, H, that is hero, raises a 300 with, what, six, five of diamonds. As you see at the top of the uh, page, we have our stack, the blinds, our position, our hand, and the number of players at the table. I have a uh, video where I teach you how to take notes at the table in this manner. You can find it at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. It's exactly what this player is doing here, and it's what I do as well. All right, so we have six, five of diamonds. We raise to 300, the hijack, the player who's trying to get us. We raise to 750, which I think is a pretty big error. When you are going to be three betting, you typically want to make it a little bit larger so at least you have some fold equity. So I hate this raise size from the hijack. You should definitely make it more like 900 or 1,000. Hero calls, as he should. Flop comes, ace, eight, three, one diamond. Hero decides to lead. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. I would almost certainly not lead in this scenario. When you lead, what happens is your opponent gets to react very well. And if your opponent is going to continue with any pair here, as he probably should, then you're gonna to need to be barreling off. And the problem here is that this is a board that should favor the opponent's range a lot. Now you say he has a wide preflop range, which this is one of these spots where I always tell the inner circle members, you know these opponents better than I do because I'm not here, but I would be very careful doing anything in this pot. I would very often just check fold here. Um, so anyway, you decide to lead. He raises the 4,500 and you call. All right, this is insane. Don't do this. We have literally no hand, literally no draw. Don't do this. <laughs> do not do this. All right, turn is a nine. Hero bets out again, 5K. This is where he caps his range in your opinion. All right, you can make him fold most aces and all other pairs on the river. I would not assume that. I don't think anyone's folding an ace on the river. I mean, like, I'm, no, I'm sure not folding an ace on the river if I'm in this opponent's scenario. Um, I do agree that he does have a lot of aces. That said, would he really raise the flop with an ace? That seems pretty bad. Unless it's ace-king, maybe, or ace-eight, or ace-three. So I don't really... I mean, I would think he has a lot more bluffs than aces, which is kind of rough, because you just are trying to bluff him off of the bluffs. That said... When he calls you, I do agree that he almost certainly does have an ace. River's a six. You bet 15K. I would probably just put him all in. I am generally going to presume in this situation that the opponent, if he does not have ace, king, or ace, queen, or ace, jack, may consider finding a fold. I don't think he should, but he may. Um, anyway, he ends up folding out ace, king, which I think is a horrible play by the opponent. One thing I see a lot whenever I'm reviewing middle stakes tournament hands is that quite often my students play a little bit too aggressively. They get a little bit too active with the idea that they are going to be able to push their opponents off of pretty good made hands. And listen, I legitimately never 
try to make my opponents fold out pretty good hands because, well, they don't fold to me. If they fold to you, that's great. I know the player who played this hand. He's a young guy. You know, he's not like a super nitty looking player. And if you have the image of a young person, I don't think this is going to work more often than not. That said, it did work. The opponent folded out ace-king. So my question would be, like, is this necessary? I would say it's absolutely not necessary. It's completely unnecessary. And I would not have made this play. I don't like this play at all. Um, so what are my thoughts on this? Oh, he calls. Ha, never mind. I thought he folded. Well, I wasn't reading. You think you ran into the top of his range, and you were close to making him that fold. Probably a good play in the long run, but risky, and it did cost you. I was thinking he folded. Ha, he did call. Okay. Well, he should have called. Folding ace-king would be terrible. That's what happens when you don't read. I guess I should mention this. I have not been through these hands at all, beyond copying and pasting them into this PowerPoint. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, yes, you did run into the top of his range, but at the same time, your opponent should literally never fold an ace-king here, or an ace-queen, or an ace-jack, in my opinion, because this is the top of his range. And if you're trying to make the opponents fold the top of their range, and you have the young kid image, that's just not going to work for you. So I hate this hand. You think it's a good play. I do not think this is a good play. This is completely unnecessary and incredibly exploitative. Now, exploitative plays are great if your opponents will make big folds, but I don't think you're getting any big folds here. Also, you say your opponent tanked for forever before calling and said he was pretty sure he had a set of eights, et cetera, et cetera. But just because someone takes a long time does not mean they're actually going to fold. Please be aware of that. Most people who take a long time are just trying to be annoyed and act like they have a tough decision. But nobody's folding ace-king here. And if they do fold ace-king, well, then they're terrible. All right, hand two, playing 100-200, ace-five of hearts. Lag under the gun raises to 875. You decide to call in the low jack seat. Um, listen, calling's okay if we're all very deep. If everyone is shallow, like let's say everyone has 30k, I would definitely just fold here. But with this deep of a stack, it's probably fine. Lag in the small blind makes it 4800. Under the gun calls and hero calls. I would fold out here. At this point, the three bet was quite large, right? So now you're not getting great odds. And if you get top pair, it's not like that's a particularly great flop for you. If we were something like, I don't even know, 100k deep, which is usually not going to happen, but if you were 100k deep, I guess you could splash around. But in this scenario, you usually want to be getting 15 to 20 to 1 implied odds, and you're not really getting that. Also, you mentioned they both have 30k, so they actually are shallower, so I would definitely fold here. It's just too likely you're going to be dominated by one or both of the players, and even if you do get top pair, you're not loving it. And if you do get a flush, there's no guarantee you're going to get paid. So I would, again, fold. So two hands where I think... You're being a little bit too optimistic. Flop comes. 10, 9, 3, 2 hearts. Small blind checks, under the gun checks. You decide to bet. And now... Well, first things first. Should we bet? And I think you probably should. This is a pretty good flop for your range. It's definitely not good for the small blind. Definitely not good for the under the gun player. So I like the idea of betting. Pot is currently 15k. They both have 30. I'm sorry, they have 25 left. I think I would just... Jam it all in here for 25k into the 15k pots. I'm usually not a big fan of making overshuffs in these scenarios, but right here, I don't think you mind jamming hands that are good but susceptible to being outdrawn, like over pairs, like 10 9, maybe hands like ace 10. And then also, you have a lot of draws you would like to jam. I don't know if you need to jam this hand though. If you're jamming this draw, you're probably jamming too many draws. The draws you want to jam first are the draws that don't have showdown value at all like queen-jack, that's a, that's a hand you really want to be jamming. Because when you jam and get called, yes, you're behind, but you still have equity. But you can't just check it down and win. Like with this ace high, sometimes you can check it down, but probably not. Um, the issue you're going to run into here is that uh, you do need to bluff with this hand at some point, but I think I would probably rather make a turn in a river bluff. Typically, you want to be using maximum fold equity with the hands that have no showdown value, and I think that's probably what you want to do in the spot with the non-ace high flush draws. Then ace high flush draw and king high flush draw, maybe you want to either check or bet small on the flop, and if it does go check, check, you bet the turn, obviously, or call a turn bet if your opponent's bet. Um, I'm trying to think if you want to bet, like how much do we want to bet if we do want to bet here? I suppose we do want to use a small bet size, and also bet here with some decent made hands, too. Anyway, you bet 5k, opponent jams, obviously you're going to call here. In this scenario, you have to put in 20 to win a pot of, what, how much is it? 50, 65? No, no, 50, 60. Say 55k. So you have to put in 
Um, 20 to win 55, so you're getting fine pot odds. And you don't get there. Is it better to fold given the odds? No, I don't think so. I don't really think too much about this concept here, that if you get a gigantic sack, you can dominate the table. Like, I don't think most people care that much, especially if this is a re-entry tournament. I mean, you are going to have a big sack, and you can lean on people a little bit, but you can't just play absurd because if your opponents have something, they're not going to fold. So, also, if you do get shallow, also don't think you're just crushed then because you still have 100 big blinds if you have 20k left. So I don't really like that idea of... Um, if you have a big sack, you can demolish your opponents, and if you don't, you can't, because, I mean, you're always playing the effective stack for the most part, right? Especially in a tournament that's not a freeze-out. And I don't know if this is a re-entry tournament or not, but most tournaments are re-entry events. And for that reason, the idea of I have a big stack, I can push people around, does not really make a lot of sense until you get to the middle or latest, later stages, when no more re-entries are available. All right, good lag in the cutoff makes it 500 tag calls. You three bet with seven five of clubs in the big blind. I would typically call here. Seven five of clubs is decent. Also, if you are going to three bet, you should probably make it a little bit more, like 3,200. Typically, from out of position, you want to make it three times the last bet, which would be 1,500, plus any additional money in the pot, which is 500 from here, and let's say another 500 from the blind, so that's 1,000. So 1,500 times three, or 1,500 plus 1,000 is 2,500, plus a little bit more because you're out of position. So I'd make it closer to 3,000 because then you actually have some fold equity. When you make it 2,200, you're going to get called by both players every time. And you want to make sure that you have some fold equity preflop because I mean, we are bluffing some portion of the time, clearly, as we are here. So you definitely want to make it bigger. Flop comes nine, six, four, two clubs. That's great. Pot is 6,600 or so with 23,000 left. So here you can bet something like four on the flop, maybe 3,500 on the flop, five or six on the turn and then jam the river. I think that'd be pretty nice. So here you do go 3,500, lag calls, tag raises to 8,500. Um, it's always a bit of a bummer when the guy raises to 8,500. In this situation... If you jam, you should expect to get called a lot. But I think that's okay just because you do have plenty of equity. It's kind of unlikely you're against a flush draw. You think the flush draws from the tag would just jam it all in. Most likely the opponent has a pretty good value hand. There's a chance he has a hand like ace nine that will fold to a shove. But for the most part, you don't love this. The question is, should you call? If you call, you can then fold to a turn shove, but you really don't want to fold the turn given you have a lot of equity. So... If you do think you have any fold equity at all, I like a shove. If you don't, you should very often call. And the reason you should call is because, say the turn is a nine of spades, right? It's a horrible card for you, or a six of spades. You could actually check fold on those turns if your opponent bets again, because your opponent then either has a better draw, which you lose to, or a better made hand, which you're drawing thinner against. So I don't really hate calling in that scenario. But I would expect, in, against some players, you do have some fold equity because they're going to show up with ace and nine and then make a big fold. Um, so that's really my consideration there is do I have fold equity? If you don't, you should call. If you do, you should probably jam. Turns out the tag has nine eight of clubs, which I think is a terrible raise on the flop. When he raises flop, he's mostly going to get in against good draws, which he's, you know, ahead, of, ahead against but not crushing them. And also over pairs, which he's crushed, crushed by. So terrible raise on the flop by the opponent, but he gets rewarded. Some people think they're supposed to raise their draws with a pair, but very often your pairs with draws are like the best draws to call with because they have a good amount of showdown value and you never have to fold them on the turn. Whereas if you have a hand like Jack two of clubs, for example, you would not mind re raising that and getting fold equity, but here you don't need fold equity. All right, what could you have done differently? Well, re-raise bigger pre-flop. It still would have gone poorly for you. Or just not re-raise pre-flop, right? You could just call and see a flop. The pot would have been way smaller then. You assumed your draws were good and that he could have two pair sets and some draws. Well, the idea of I thought my draw was good doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You want to make sure that you're always thinking in the terms of how much equity do I have against my opponent's range and how much fold equity do I have? Because obviously your opponent's going to have the nut flush draw sometimes, right? Or king high flush draw or hands like king queen of clubs or queen ten of clubs, hands like that. So your draw is not always good. Um, but yes, I would assume he has a lot of Mainly sets and strong top pairs. I wouldn't expect too many two pairs, right? Because 
he called a raise and then called a re-raise. So he probably doesn't have 9-6 or 6-4. So most likely you're going to be against sets or strong top pairs. So that's what I would expect to be against. And then some draws. But there are a lot of draws available, given all the overcard flush draws. So it's a pretty junky spot for you, really. It's not, not a great scenario. All right. 150-300, you have 30K. Looks like you re-entered, so it is a re-entry tournament. So... Under the gun, plus one raises to 900. Super lag, who isolates all the time, makes it 2100, which is a terrible re-raise size. We have six five of diamonds in the hijack. Playing 30k deep, again, you have to fold. If we're finding anything in these hands, it's that you are being way too splashy pre-flop. And I know splashy play often does get rewarded. I mean, if you look at the um, first few seasons of the World Poker Tour, Dan Nogranu won like all the tournaments by playing really, really splashy and just running a bit hot in the big pots. He would call a re-raise with 10-7 suited, and it will come 10-7-3, or he'd flop an open-ended straight draw, and he would get there. And I understand it's great when that happens, but more often than not, it's just not going to work out for you. And in this scenario, you need 20 to 1 implied odds or, or more. So you want to do, you want to do it 2,000 times 20 is, that's 40,000, right? You want to make sure you can win at least 40,000 chips out of this pot. But you know, you can only get 30 because that's how deep your stack is. And you're not going to stack two players, right? So here you're not getting anywhere near the requisite implied odds. So you just have to fold. Also, the under the gun player could re-raise and then force you off your hand completely, which is terrible because then you just gave away 2100. So you cannot call here. This is way too loose and way too splashy. All right, you call under the gun folds. Terrible fold for under the gun. I mean, like under the gun plus one. I don't know what he could possibly be playing here. That's going to call a 900 or call, raise to 900 and then fold for only 1200 more. It makes literally no sense. Maybe like ace 10 offsuit or something maybe that's a hand you could fold but even then it's pretty tempting to getting your four or five to one pot odds all right flop comes eight five two lag bets 1200 you call it's fine you're not raising a tricky player because you don't want to be raised off your draw you say raised off your draw we have a pair right we have six five and diamonds so we have a junky one pair hand so not a great hand um i i would definitely call in the scenario but that's not it's not necessarily because i'm thinking i don't want to get raised off my hand it's more so thinking i have a marginal made hand and i want to keep my opponent in with all of his bluffs and there are a lot of bluffs available if you do raise here and get re-raised it is pretty unfortunate i mean you say the guy is loose aggressive depends on how super loose aggressive he is i mean if he's an actual lunatic then maybe you can just raise and get it all in but that would be pretty aggressive so i like the call you could also raise small but if you raise small and then he calls or re-raises you really don't know what to do so I like calling, understanding that your opponent does almost certainly have six clean outs to better hands, but that's okay. Um, next, turns a king. He bets 3,800, you call. King's very bad for you. I would call again, though, because now ace, king, king, queen, king, jack all get there, and those could certainly be in his range. River's a four. He bets 7K. You decide to call. I mean, this is, again, one of these spots where it depends a lot on your opponent's overall strategy. If he's going to be bluffing here with ace, queen, ace, jack, Queen Jack, Jack 10, Queen 10, etc., then um, calling becomes fine. But if he's going to be checking and folding a lot of those hands, then calling becomes pretty bad, even if the guy is super loose and aggressive. In this scenario, you maybe got clout, or your decision became clouded by the idea that your opponent is generally loose and aggressive, and that's a problem. In hindsight, should you have noticed that this guy's three betting a lot, but a little bit less? Hmm. What are my thoughts on this? What about a big flop raise? So, yeah, I kind of mentioned here that this guy's re-raise size is very odd. Whenever you are re whenever you do see people re-raise small, especially if they're using a lot of different sizings for their three bets, usually the small three bets are going to be for value, and the bigger three bets will be for bluffs, just in general. It's not a good play, but it is what a lot of people do. So if you think the guy has a very strong range, and he's going bet, 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 it's going to look like a lot of aces, kings, or ace, king, right? Should you have raised the flop big? I don't think so. You understand when you're calling the flop bet, your opponent is drawing quite live to six-ish outs, but you have a very obvious marginal made hand. We're not playing our hand like a draw. This is a marginal made hand, and with a marginal made hand, we want to see a cheap showdown. We discussed this thoroughly at PokerCoaching.com in the homework challenges, where you always want to categorize your hands into premium made hands and draws, which should often be played aggressively, and then marginal made hands and junk, which should usually be played very cautiously. And this is obviously a marginal made hand. Middle pair, no kicker, is almost always a marginal made hand. All right, here we have 30K. 
eight cent of clubs under the gun. We raise to 1,000. We get two callers. Flop comes 987. This is a terrible flop for your range in general, but you should still be betting with some draws and some nut hands. You do have nines, eight sevens, nine eight suited, jack ten suited, etc. So which draws make a lot of sense? Well, draws with a 10, right? Draws with a 10 make a lot of sense. Draws with a jack make a lot of sense. So you have to ask, would I raise king 10 suited under the gun? Maybe, maybe not. If you don't, then this is basically the best 10, right? To be betting. Uh, again, if you have more showdown value, those are hands you want to be checking first. So you typically want to be checking ace 10, but betting, checking ace 10 before you bet uh, king 10. King 10 should be bet before ace 10. Also, queen jack should very likely be bet here before either of those hands because it completely lacks showdown value and it does still have some playability. So queen jack should definitely be bet, king 10 should definitely be bet, and ace 10 should probably be bet as well. So I like this bet. You bet under the gun plus one, two calls and small blind calls. That's not ideal. Now you have to presume you're against two pretty strong ranges. And I would just be getting out of the way here. Whenever you're against two opponents, yes, I understand they didn't raise, but it's so easy for them to have hands like top pair or eight seven or a hand like ace 10 as well, right? Also, they could just be slow playing. Never presume you know exactly how your opponent's going to play their range. Because if they play their range very differently than you think they're going to play their range, and you really adjust to uh, take advantage of whatever, however you think they're going to play their range, then you're going to end up making mistakes if you get it wrong, and sometimes you will get it wrong. Anyway, turns of three, small blind bets 4k. Yuck. Pot is currently 10, 11, 12, 13. So you have to put in four to win what's going to be about 20. And you could still get raised. Man, I think I would probably call here, but I would hate it. I mean, I presume when small blind leads, small blind should have a lot of either medium strength made hands or very strong made hands. I don't expect to see a ton of draws here. So given I don't expect to see a ton of draws, it's, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to raise because if the opponent does have a premium made hand, like a set, he's obviously not going to fold. And if he does have a marginal made hand, it's usually going to be with a jack or a 10 in it, like jack 9 or 10 9 or 10 8. And those hands may call a turn bet and then not fold on the river some portion of the time. Given stacks are already getting shallow, right? You started with 30 and you already have uh, 14 in there, right? So you only have 15k left on the river. So your opponent's going to be getting 3 to 1 pot odds. A lot of people don't make big folds getting 3 to 1 pot odds. So I would have just called the 4k, I think. Understanding I have a drawing hand, I don't love it, but it's probably a little bit too good to fold. So anyway, you raise and the opponent calls. And again, I would just be done with it. I'm not bluffing at this. River's an ace, which is great. You actually have some showdown value now. Opponent checks. Should you value bet? I would generally say no. I think it is still somewhat likely you're beat here. And if you bet and get... If you bet, I don't think your opponent's going to call with many worse hands. Besides maybe like pocket tens. But you block that. So this is a spot where I think you probably just need to check. It goes check, check, and you win, which is great. Um, you're against 10-9. So again, terribly played hand by the opponent. I don't know why he would possibly want to lead the turn. Again, it seems like people just don't really understand when they have a marginal made hand or a draw. And this is just a very clear marginal made hand that wants to check. So it's great that your opponents are making these errors. Um, so should you have gone for a river value bet? I don't think so. In this scenario, I think it's just too likely that if you bet, your opponent's going to fold out most 10s and most 9s. I'm sorry, most nines and most eights. And is basically never going to fold a better hand than yours, right? So you're trying to get called by, I don't even know what. Like, will king nine call about a value bet on the river? Maybe a tiny one. I mean, if you are going to bet, I like the idea of betting small. Because very often when you are value betting thinly, you want to make sure you're getting called by worse hands. So if you are going to bet, you want to bet small. Maybe even like 20% pot. But then that opens the door for you to get raised, which is always dicey. Like right here, if you bet 20% pot on the river, your opponent should strongly consider jamming you. Then what, right? Um, so no, I don't like a bet on the river. All right, here I have pocket, I'm not pocket sixes. This is hand six. <laughs> we have six three suited, all right. Lag raises to 700, hijack calls, you decide to re-raise. Don't do this, you're playing way too aggressively. There are better hands to bluff with, like six five suited or 9-7 suited, right? Those hands are going to have way more post-flop playability. Also, you could re-raise with some big Broadway hands like Queen-10 offsuit. I think that would be fine. 
It seems like you're just being a little bit too aggressively across the board. And, and like I said, whenever you are playing too aggressively across the board, sometimes you will get lucky and just hit a lot of flops and win a lot of pots. But this is just unnecessary. You're playing too aggressively unnecessarily. All right. They've been playing many pots and are aggressively attacking the blinds. It's fine. If you are going to re-raise it, you want to make it about this size, so that's good. But I would still just not do this. All right. 6-3 suited. Flop comes 9-6-5. You bet 5k into 10-ish. Low jack calls, okay. I'm trying to think if you even want to bet this flop. I think it's fine to bet. I understand you have basically a crappy draw. Um, it's like a crappy marginal made hand, which essentially is a draw if you bet and get called here. So the question is, should you bet small or should you bet big? In general, on these very coordinated boards, you should just bet big. And given you don't actually have very many obvious bluffs to bluff with, I mean, at least in my mind, maybe you do have a lot of obvious bluffs if you have all, sort, all sorts of hands with a random 8 or a random 7. But if you don't have very many hands with a random 8 or a random 7, then it's probably an okay hand to bluff. And I would probably start off betting a little bit bigger. You say they have 30k. I think you can bet something like 6 or 7k on the flop, something like 7 or 8k on the turn and then jam the river. Alternatively, you could just bet 7k on the flop and then jam the turn. Probably go up to 14, 15, 14, so it'd be 24k if you bet here. Yeah, you could just bet flop and then jam turn. That's probably pretty nice. Turns native diamonds, which is awful for your range, right? You should have almost no sevens, like I said. So given you should have almost no sevens, I think it's just a check fold. Also, it is somewhat likely your opponent does have a seven or a set or two pair, and a seven or a set and two pair are not going to be folding. You decide to bet tiny, though. I don't know why you're doing this. You think your turn bet was not great, probably too low. Almost asking to get raised. Uh, yeah, I generally agree. He raises and you decide to call. You cannot call here. You are just drawing so thin. In this scenario, either your opponent has a better made hand, which you're drawing to five outs against, right? Or five, six outs again. No, five outs. Two sixes, three, five, three threes. And even then, if you get there, you could still lose, right? If your opponent just has a set, you're dead. If your opponent has a straight, you're dead. So you have to fold the turn. You have to fold the turn. All right, Rivers and Ace. You check, he checks, he wins with jacks, which is pretty brutal that he decided to raise you on the turn with jacks. But like you said, maybe your small bet induced that. If you continue the turn, should you have pushed the river when the flush comes in? I mean, maybe. The problem is your opponent can just have a 7. And if the guy has a 7, he's literally never folding. You should have just folded to the turn raise. You're being way too sticky here. And being sticky in these scenarios is going to get you in a lot of trouble. Unless your opponents are just straight up lunatics. But even then... Like, what, what, what can a lunatic have that you're happy against? I mean, you could have jack-10 of clubs, right? I mean, you're happy against that, but even then, that has loads of equity. So just check fold the turn. You have to get out of the way here. You're, you're playing way too loosely. All right, here you raise to 900. Splashy guy in the low jack calls. Big blind calls. We have a7 offsuit under the gun plus three. Just fold preflop. This is too loose. a7 offsuit is not a playable hand in these scenarios. I'm glad we're going through these hands because we're finding lots of spots where we're playing just a little bit too loosely and it's tending to get you in a lot of trouble. And, you know, I know you ended up winning the tournament, so like I said, loose play does sometimes get rewarded when everything starts clicking, but it doesn't click all that often. All right, flop comes 4-3-2, small blind checks, you continuation bet, and I'm fine with continuation betting here. This is a spot that should not connect so well with your opponents. Um, that said, you do need to be looking to bluff a decent amount of the time on the turn and river when you are betting this hand because it's not a great hand, doesn't have a ton of showdown value. So I like betting, but, you know, be prepared. Now, low jack raises, small blind, folds, you call. Just fold. Just fold again. You need to be making earlier folds. You are getting way too far out of line in these spots, and it's getting you in a lot of trouble. Turns of six, you check. You're planning to check, raise, bluff. Well, how many fives do you have in your range, right? Probably not a ton. How many flush draws do you have in your range? I mean, to be fair, you could have some, but also the opponent should have a lot of flush draws that got there on the turn. So it's just not necessary, right? If you want to be check, raising the turn, you need to be doing it with a club. If you're going to be floating the flop, when you, when you bet and get raised, you need to be doing it with a club. You don't have a club. This is just spewing money. Check, check. River's a queen. If you're going to bet, you need to bet big, and I would bet big here. You essentially have the bottom of your range. Again, ideally, you'd like to have a club in your hand. That way you block some flushes. But I would definitely bet big. Betting small is not good at all, because when you bet small, your opponent's going to call with all the bluff catchers, which should be almost all of his range when the turn goes check-check. You may be thinking, but there's a straight on board. There's a flush on board. 
There are, but you should have virtually no fives in your range, or raising from this position, almost no fives. And it just doesn't make sense, right? And your opponent should be checking with a lot of their marginal made hands on the turn. So your opponent has like all bluff catchers, and you really don't want to try to bluff people off bluff catchers, especially with a small sizing. So if you are going to bet the river, you want to be blasting it. But again, you'd rather block flushes and whatnot. In hindsight, you should probably fold a7 to start. Yes. What do you think about this, given your opponent was quite splashy? I think that's irrelevant. I think you're playing too much into the fact that your opponents are loose, aggressive, and splashy. And, you know, to be fair, the fact that your opponent's splashy means he has more flushes and more fives than the normal player. Because this guy may call a preflop raise with 7-5 offsuit for all we know, right? But yes, just fold preflop. When you're playing against players who play way too many hands, way too aggressively, they don't fold too often, you want to make sure you just play better hands than them. And playing hands that are not that great is playing really right into their strength. You want to make sure that you just start off with a decent advantage. And you do that just by playing better cards. Whenever your opponents use gigantic raises, or they play way too loose and way too splashy, or they're calling stations, any of those three things, just play tight, aggressive, fundamentally sound poker. That's how you win. It's not fancy. It's not creative. That's not how you beat players like this. The loose, aggressive, battling poker is good against players who are too aggressive and who are in there battling too hard themselves and also against players who are just like really 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 weak until of course they show that they have a good hand all right one more hand for today we have uh, now we're playing 500 to 1000 we're playing we have queen nine offsuit in the small blind lag under the gun raises to 2400 low jack calls you call just fold preflop fold preflop again almost all of these hands actually have been fold preflop i know it's not fun but notice all these difficult spots you're finding yourself in. It's because you're starting off with hands that just don't make good hands. Whenever you start off with a lot of garbage, you end up making a lot of garbage on the flop. When you have a lot of garbage on the flop, you know from studying at PokerCoaching.com, you have too much junk in your range. And when you have too much junk in your range, you either have to bluff a ton, seems like your opponents aren't making big folds though, or you just have to give up a lot. And you don't want to give up a lot. You don't want to have to bluff a ton. All right, flop comes Jack. 8-7, you check, under the gun checks, lag bets 4,500, you raise. So this is one of the first times I'm actually okay with your raise. Again, though, you want to have a spade in your hand. Here we have a hand that cannot check calls, definitely not good enough to check calls, so that doesn't make sense. So either we need to raise or fold. If I had a spade in my hand, I would definitely raise here. If I don't have a spade, it's probably still just a fold. Um, that said, this is far more reasonable than some of the previous bluffs. Under the gun folds, lag calls, turns to six of spades. I would definitely just be bluffing. I mean, yes, again, I would much, much, much rather have a spade in my hand, but we don't because you decided to bluff too much on the flop. Again, on the flop, notice you play this hand, you end up making too much junk. Um, so you decide to check turn. Let's see, you made it 12 and a half thousand means you have about 25K left. Ugh, yuck, right? I think you just need to check and give up again because you have so many hands that do have a spade in them that can keep betting, like queen of spades, nine. That would be a fine hand just to jam the turn. But with this hand, if you're bluffing this hand, you have way too many bluffs. And also, ideally, you don't want to be bluffing with too many hands that are just stone dead whenever they get called. And when you get called in this spot, you could very easily be stone dead, at least when you have queen of spades in your hand. You block your opponent's calling range, right? Because you have the queen of spades. And if they call this a flush draw, or flush worse than the queen of spades, you have outs to improve to the flush. So you'd much rather have um, a spade in your hand than no spade. Check, check. River, you decide to bet 15K. Your opponent goes all in for 10K more, obviously fold. Um, should we bluff River? Yeah, probably. I'm okay with the River bluff. Should you jam it all in? No. I think here, again, pot's 25K. I think this is fine if you are going to be running a bluff. You're trying to get your opponent off of unpaired or your un non-flush hands. So you really don't need to go all that big. I think 15 into 25 is fine. Maybe even like 12 into 25 is fine. Most people aren't going to call you with one pair on a for a, a half pot bet on a four flush board, which is very likely what your opponent has. So I think you could probably get away with going just a little bit smaller. Then when you get jammed, you save a few thousand chips, which does add up. Should you just stay away from this before the flop? Yes, fold preflop. And on the flop... You're bluffing too much if you're bluffing with these without spades. And remember, it's not just queen nine. It's also any hand with a nine and any hand with a 10. All of those are decent bluff candidates. And if you bluff with all of them, you're going to have far too many bluffs in your range. Did you bet the river too high? Yes, probably. He was trying to bluff 
on the river, 10K would have gotten it done as well, you think, and I completely agree. So these were a lot of pretty rough hands, um, and they could have all been solved by simply playing a tighter strategy. Um, one of my students, here you see Ken right here, actually just won the Maryland State Poker Championship. Congrats to him, it was on his birthday. He used to play a lot of hands, a large percentage of hands. He doesn't look like it because he's an older guy, but he used to be very loose and very splashy. He started tightening up a bit and then started winning tournaments. Who would have thought? So congrats to Ken for that. Also, check out pokercoaching.com. You can go and get your completely free seven-day trial. Um, we have lots and lots of interactive quizzes where I essentially I go through hands and show you how I suggest playing all of these relatively difficult spots. So check that out. You can start your completely free trial at pokercoaching.com today. So thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed these hands. If you like this format, let me know. We can certainly do more like this. And if you thought this was boring, well, I hope you went to the next video a long time ago. Thanks for watching. Click like, click subscribe, share this with your friends, and I'll talk to you again later. Thanks for watching.